Welcome to tonight's committee meeting. For Thursday, January 2nd, tonight's school board meeting. May I please have the attendance? Mrs. Durgan. Mrs. Giftos. Here. Dr. Gill. Here. Ms. Casalonis. Here. Ms. Layton. Here. Mrs. Scyther. Here. Mrs. Turner. Here. Ms. Caldwell. Here. And Mr. Bennett. Here. Can you please join me for tonight's Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, tonight, there are, is an adjustment for tonight's agenda. We're moving 10.0, the motion to approve the Building Steering Committee's recommendation of a consolidated primary school to our next meeting on the 19th. Are there any other adjustments to be made? Okay. Seeing none, public comment on tonight's agenda items. Good evening, my name is Jean Marie Katarina and I'm, I live at 311 Gorham Road. I'm here today not just as a citizen but as a member of the Scarborough Town Council. I will tell you that I'm not speaking for the Town Council tonight but I am representing my own concerns. Um, <clears throat> basically, I'd like to speak about this consolidated elementary school. I know that in 2017 there was um, reports and discussion with the school board at that time and timelines laid forward. Um, and I have to tell you, I was totally shocked, shall I say, or surprised to see that this discussion was brought forward um, with little or no notice to the public and particularly with little or no notice to the town council. Um, I am glad to see that, you know, we're going through the process um, of this committee that you have. And I would just ask that you share more of your information and your thoughts on what's going to happen uh, with the council because at this point, I know speaking for myself, and you know I'm a huge school supporter, that uh, I cannot support um, the plans to put anything on the referendum in 2020 at this point. Uh, I also want to add that I certainly hope that you settle this contract with the teachers sooner rather than later. on the agenda items? Okay, seeing none, I do have a statement. I'd like to take a moment to recognize our hardworking teachers who are in attendance tonight. Although the teacher contract is not an agenda item, it cannot be discussed under public comments. Both parties agreed to close negotiations process and therefore we cannot allow negotiations to occur in public. We are in the middle of fact finding and will follow this process to its conclusion. Um, therefore, there will be no public comments on this topic tonight. I'd like to thank you for your continued commitment to academic excellence and our Scarborough students. As you may know, we entered into fact-finding due to good faith disagreements about what should be in the contract. We await the January 7th report from the fact-finding panel and hope that it will help us to reach a settlement. Moving into superintendent's report. <coughs> Okay, thank you. I'd um, like to talk about enrollment and just a comparison. As you can see on the screen up there, uh, the high school is, um, you look at January 1st enrollment versus December 1st enrollment, and we're up one student. Uh, the middle school, we're at 701, up two students. Wentworth, 666, it's pretty flat from previous. And Blue Point School, uh, 204 students, up two students recently, and eight corner school is at 240, no increase or decrease, and Pleasant Hill School is at 204, and it's been pretty flat for the last couple months as well. So, if you look at the total population, we're at 3,004, up two students, and on the right-hand column, the analysis done uh, a while ago, as far as enrollment within the community projections, we're really right at target. Um, or 3,003, 3, 
the total population. So I would say that that analysis has been uh, very instrumental as we begin to plan ahead and look at the population. Thank you. Moving into the chair's report, a um, couple items of recognition tonight. First, I'd like to welcome Dr. Netto to her new role okay. and her first meeting with us. Okay. We're really excited to have you here and welcome. A couple items of great news. Um, we had two Scarborough coaches who were recognized as coaches of the decade, Tom Griffin and Derek Veyu, who have done amazing things with their respective teams, um, as well as two seniors who have been labeled or nominated as recognized um, Red Storm Athletes of the Decade. Bella Dickinson, who has had an outstanding career in softball as well as basketball and volleyball, and Jarrett Flaker, who, while I may usually cheer from him from the gridiron, is probably one of the fastest runners in, in the country. I mean, he is just incredible track and field wise. Um, so wanted to recognize them. We have invited them to an upcoming meeting, so we look forward to them being here to congratulate them publicly, but I did not want to take the time, or I did not want to pass the opportunity to recognize those great accomplishments. And then I wanted to discuss the community forum that we had on the 19th. It was a great turnout. Um, we had a very different format than what we've had previously. It was. Um, much more open communication where people were able to speak longer than the usual three minutes. We had back and forth with our committee, which was really important. Um, we were able to flesh out a lot of discussion points, and I think it gave us a good foundation to have a conversation tonight about what we heard. We have committee members here as well as Todd Jackson, who I'm going to ask at some point you guys come up to the podium so that we can go through the things that the board may have for questions. Um, 21 community members came and spoke or emailed us uh, regarding the topic of a consolidated school. And five main topics really rose out. Busing and how we would manage the busing routes. Traffic flow, depending on where that consolidated school may land. Um, the size of the building and the footprint to support the students as, you know, Mr. Prince mentioned, we have quite a, a huge population of students and how do we make them feel as though it's an easy transition in such a large building for our youngest students. Um, bonding concern due to costs of such a facility and its footprint, as well as building a fourth school and what it would cost to retrofit the building. So really just want to open this up to a conversation with the committee members, Todd, and ourselves um, to talk about what we heard that night. If anyone wants to start. So 21 people are valued in our community. And you have hundreds here that represent your staff and you don't want to hear from them. That's not what is being said. As we had mentioned, the, talk, the teacher's contract is not on tonight's agenda. We also, all parties agreed that it was a closed negotiation. We can't have that conversation publicly. They're not negotiating. We're not, we're not negotiating. They're not negotiating with you. We no can, member of the negotiating team will stand at that podium. We can't have discussions about that contract at that podium. I'm sorry. But we're talking about schools. We're talking about consolidated schools, consolidated staff. I'm sorry, we can't. We're talking we, schools. We're talking teachers. We can talk about we're a consolidated about. school. We may not have the conversation about the contract. I, I'm sorry, I understand. You took time out of your day. It's the first day back. This is not something that we can do. So let's not talk contract, let's talk quality of school. Yeah. I'm, I'm calling for a 10 minute recess, please.
going to respectfully ask that the meeting is allowed to continue in its format. Um, I understand the frustrations, but please allow us to continue the business meeting. Is there any discussion about the form? Do we want to go? Do we want to go item by item? Do we? Do you want to kind of speak? So interestingly, after we had this conversation at our last meeting, I was actually having a conversation with the superintendent, and we were saying and kind of reflecting on the fact that even as we sit in this room, we are surrounded by schools, ex-schools, that our town moved away from that have since become private places of business. And so it's interesting as we're talking about this, and before we get into the individual um, items and different to uh, topics, I just think it's interesting that we're kind of at a place where we're at another turning point in history, where we're looking at some of our buildings that are timing out in their current use. But I have no doubt that no matter what we do, whether we consolidate or we build a fourth school or as time goes by, any building or plot will continue to serve our community in some way, whether it be private or public. And so I just thought it was interesting historically to think about that on the, on the heels of our last discussion, because this has all happened before with many schools in town. I'd, I'd like to speak about um, the, our ability to get this information out to the public. And mm -hmm. I'm happy to see that um, there are some town council members that have chosen to join us in this conversation now um, as we've extended that opportunity and um, have reached out repeatedly asking for um, a seat at the table. And we do have Peter Hayes who has chosen to join us. Um, I know um, Paul Johnson chose to join us at one occasion. So it's nice to see that, um, although I think that one of the council members left before this discussion, that there is another council member who's chosen to join the discussion because there is so much information to get caught up on after months of discussions and trying to bring people to the table. So thank you for that. All right, I'm diving in. Thank you. Um, so some of the topics that came up when we were here last time, I think some of them um, are a little premature in terms of discussing right away. Um, I don't think we as a group can sit here and say we know the answer to some of these questions. And I think we could talk about them, but I just want to sort of preface all that conversation by saying things that we you know, kind of come up with and discuss um, are probably or may get decided against. Uh, when the people who are the experts in these fields sit down and work full time on these issues. Um, things like busing and traffic flow, uh, the size of the school, how we design that school, how the children would integrate into that environment. Um, I'm going to skip right over bonding, but then going back to um, whether a fourth school is the right answer or how we would retrofit schools, those are really intensely focused around design issues. Um, so I think. I'd love to talk about all those bits and hear what everyone has to say. I think we did have some really good conversations last time around, um, but I just sort of wanted to preface it with, um, I hope no one's expecting the, the answer for all these things. So I'm, I'm willing to stand here. And <laughs> I just have a question or a comment. I think on the last bullet, because I think what we're being asked to approve is for you guys to move forward with the consolidation option. 
whereas I see that last bullet as a totally different option. And I don't know if that's the case or if maybe it can be worked into um, the RFP that we put out. RFQ. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, because a lot of what, like the notes, I was reviewing my notes earlier today, and a lot of the feedback that we got was around, have you considered this option? And I know you guys have talked about it, and right. I trust that it's not a feasible option. I don't <laughs> think that it will, or not the most feasible option. But I, I just think there, there may be an opportunity to talk about that more publicly, the work, the sure. research that went into that, and why that is not the best option for this town. Well, I think, and it came up a little bit, I tried to elicit a little bit of response. I think one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, um, how much do we want to pay for that system? You know, because we're talking about four project sites, three of which will be populated with children. So that'll come into a, a significantly long construction phase. So the dollar signs for that solution if we don't care about the dollar signs, it's a great solution, right? Everyone will be pleased. We'll have brand new facilities. Some of them, three of the four, will have somewhat undersized classrooms. Maybe we can deal with that in some way with design. Uh, the fourth one will be beautiful and new and have everything right sized. Um, but, and I can't say this with 100% certainty because I'm an engineer and I hate that, um, but I can go to 98% and say that's a much more expensive solution, uh, both in, both in terms of just outright dollars, because we have four project sites, but also because the time value, the value of time and the increased or decreased value of money over time. So the longer a project takes, the more it ends up costing yeah. because of inflation and escalation. Okay. If, and it's a logistically challenging solution as well. Um, just to jump on, not to leave Andrew yeah. up here, no, I'll watch. <laughs> So, I mean, it's when we looked at the renovation and expansion um, options as well, there was the same challenge. You know, what do you do with the students while they're in school? And building a fourth school and retrofitting the existing schools has the exact same challenge. You know, where do you put them? You, do you have them there while construction is going on for the renovation and addition? Because you don't really have a choice where else to put them. So it's the same issue. That, that's, the, that's the real underlying issue here. Tom brought up a good you know, example of how it was dealt with in the past with building a temporary space to flex out the students. So, I mean, there are ways to do it. If we want to do it, it can be done. I think what we just like to say is there's definitely a significant dollar cost with that format. And so, I mean, I almost was thinking about this after we left the meeting last week thinking like ranked choice might be the way to go here. It's like, you know, what's more important to you? You know, the total dollars, what do we bond? What do we expend on this? Or you know, is that less important than having four schools? Or is one school that's really equitable for all the children? You know, because that's one of the other things I worry about personally, is that, you know, I buy a house in Blue Point, uh, and my friends buy a house over near the new school, and their kids get a facility that's better than my facility. And I just worry about, you know, we don't change the tax rate based on which school your children go to. So that, feels a little bit like there's a tension there as well. Yeah. One, of the, one of the things we've discussed in long range planning that pertains to this, because we've gone in and out of this discussion too, mm -hmm. and, and so when I look at that last bullet up there, I think about some of the things that we can't change about the three schools that we have. And no matter how much renovation we put in or how many dollars we put toward it, there are certain problems, like we have some traffic flow issues at a couple of our schools. I mean, I live in the Pleasant Hill neighborhood and it's a, it's a great little school, but every day there's cars parked up and down all the streets. And, and even if we were to renovate that building and make it look like it just flew in from 2030, you're still gonna be married to that plot and that spot and the limitations, I'm not trying to rhyme, I swear, and, and, and the limitations of where, of where those schools are. And so um, I just wonder from a long-term perspective, because I have my long-term planning hat on, mm -hmm. even if we were to make those schools gorgeous today, are we still saddled with a prettier, more futuristic version of the limitations that we're talking about that brought us to this discussion? That, that's something that I've been thinking about since that last meeting, because um, I heard the public loud and clear when they talked about the, the will to build a fourth school, but I think about the equity issues you're talking about. Um, I, I think it's still a very interesting suggestion, but how much are we just kicking down the road from a planning standpoint by sticking with those three spots with an additional fourth school? I mean, I think mm -hmm. if, if Kylie were here, um, Kylie Mason is on the planning board. She's yeah. a planner. She's a sure. state planner. And she has strongly spoken in the past about the difficulties of, of that, the 
existing sites um, and that they don't have things that if we were building a new building we would do like you know emergency access for fire truck police all the way around the building can't do that in the existing building so adding that in means well do we tear down part of the building you know you got two structural engineers here so the first thing we're going to start talking about is how those buildings weren't designed to meet current code so um, renovating a building where you think you're going to leave the shell in place uh, but what reality is going to have to happen is you're going to have to completely rebuild that shell anyways because it's almost 99 percent sure unreinforced masonry which you're not allowed to put anymore um, the rooms have such little uh, insulation um, rules will allow require us to reanalyze the rooms for all the new snow load requirements and so that means reinforcing those rooms so those are that's just the envelope and then what you're talking about is the interior and so bearing walls divide up those spaces and so when you try and move a bearing wall you have to restructure it so you kind of left with well we've got a hole in the ground we can build on top of so it that's why i'm saying it feels like mm -hmm. keeping the three and bringing them up to date is a much more expensive venture than making them look nice it's really right. talking about bringing them all the way back to very bare structure and starting again and so i mean i think it's important when when people enter the conversation sort of midstream that they understand that this conversation has been occurring for years now and that um, the school system has employed experts to conduct studies and that um, that data has been analyzed by prior school boards and current school boards and the building steering committee is uh, comprised of many subject matter experts and we again utilized um, outsourced experts to, to help consult with that We've included the community members um, in those conversations, the uh, members of the school community. So um, these discussions have all occurred. It's just, um, it's, you know, it's starting to get media attention. And so I think that people may not have heard the conversations where we've talked in depth for hours about why um, some choices may seem to make more sense. And so now we're at the sort of the highlight mm -hmm point of view of, of talking about that. And I think it's important that people understand that those conversations have been occurring with people, many of the people in this room for hours and, and yet still for, for years. So there's some institutional knowledge and, and about that as well. Yes. I'm just gonna add a little bit more on to that. With, with the option of building a fourth school and retrofitting the existing, existing buildings, there is the potential to you know, if you build the, the new school, obviously it's going to conform to all new, all the current guidelines. With if you had the, if you're renovating the, the three existing schools, it really depends on how much you want to spend. You know, it's um, and how much you, how much you want to increase the, um, the like the areas and, and everything of the, of the classrooms and all the different guidelines to to come to the current recommendations. So, it's. And what what Andrew's describing with it, with the uh, the con like concrete masonry unit walls, like the the cinder block walls as you see them in the classrooms, you know those are those are the dividing walls that you know if you start if you want to expand your classroom area, those are the walls that are going to have to be demolished. So that's what opens a can of worms, and you end up spending quite a bit when you start saying, okay, I want to get the classrooms to be of a certain size. So I mean, yes, there's potential to renovate. Uh, to a smaller degree, the existing schools, but they won't get you to the current uh, state recommended guidelines. So people, I mean, the school would be far short of what you're getting from the fourth school. Can you also talk about, I think last time, Dave, you talked about the existing structure of the land and how we can't really support going wider. It would have to go up and, and sort of the complicated that as well, right? Andrew, I mean, and why we can't go up or why that's more complicated. Yeah, actually, you know better than I do. Well, so you can I think one of the conversations we're having is, you know, the student population is young. And so uh, there's sort of code requirements, and then there's best practices, and then there's the things we want to do for the right reasons. Um, if we're going to put a second story onto a primary school building, um, we have to think about, you know, someone made a really a nice comment about worrying about their child getting lost in a big school. And so it's that same sort of idea that when your child is panicked and you're young, little child, um, are they gonna know exactly the egress path? And if they're on the second floor, which they're to take? 
and which direction to get to the outside. So in a primary school, what you're really trying to do is make it supremely obvious. When, you know, when I went to school, the door was on the back of the classroom to the outside, and that's how we did our fire drill. We don't do that anymore. That's a security nightmare. Um, but the same ideas apply. We want to make sure that when a child leaves a classroom, they have a line of sight to where the outdoors is. So when something goes wrong, fire, who knows what, um, there's an easy egress path in. If you add a second story, you start making that a complicated path. You can see the outside, but you can't get there. You have to go downstairs and blind path. So code tries to steer you away from putting people in places where they can't easily by themselves get out. And so we talked a little bit about, you know, you can't put kindergartners on the second floor. I can't tell you for certain that that's a law in Maine, but it's definitely uh, the International Building Code wants us to stay away from doing things like that. That's best practice per se. Thank you. I guess, I, so Sarah, I don't know if, I'm sorry, I just called you by your first name like we've known each other for years. I, um, <laughs> you probably broke some rule that I don't know about. <laughs> Please refer to me as Ms. <laughs> <laughs> What I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very long, I think we just had a really long-winded response to your question. Yeah. Why did we recommend to consolidate it and not, why do we feel like we don't want to put out an RFQ that would say, consider all options? I think the answer is two part. The first part we kind of went over here is that we didn't really feel like there was great merit in that in terms of financial and equity. I mean, there's definitely some other emotional reasons and maybe some other reasons I'm not thinking of right now that would make for good, but the ones that came up when we discussed at length in some heated discussions in our groups, um, that we really did come to the decision that consolidated was the, the best solution, not necessarily the only right answer, but the best solution. Okay. Um, the other part of that is, well, we're sort of on a, you know, children keep coming in, um, enrollment is growing. Mm -hmm. The more complicated problem we hand to a designer to solve, the longer they're going to need to up with that solution. Yeah. So if we're trying to address this situation in a, a relatively quick path that gets us to the solution in less than, well, I'm going to put a year at it. I think it's better if we can do sort of that pre-decision making for that and not leave it too wide open, that'll sort of hamstring the designers into answering so many questions that the time we allot them can't be used for uh, the more nuanced answers that we want to get out of them. Yeah, and I think, um, and thank you for that, and it, you did answer my question. I think part of the reason why I was asking it is, is to address what Alicia said, which is people are going to come in and out of this conversation over right. the next however many years, and we need, and this is more of something for us, I think, to think about is how do we make sure that we can easily share with them the information that you guys have spent hours and hours working on and, and years before that without them having to sit down and read 20 pages of documents. And, and one of the questions yeah, yeah. that I know we're going to get as a finance committee is what are the other options cost? And I know you can't give me a number right now. I wouldn't ask you to do that. But just hearing you say that you know with confidence that it's much more expensive is sufficient for me. I know that there will be some people who that isn't suffi sufficient for, but I think it's a start. And so I think as an action for us to think about is how we can bring people into the conversation no matter where they they are where they're coming in. But one of the things we discussed was a subcommittee and whose role could be communication and and with the with the community and um, trying to trying to solicit input and and also trying to sort of get that message out there. So yeah. I'm hoping that we can cool. do that as we move forward. Also to your point, Sarah, I think one of the one of the things that has kind of naturally evolved or that I see has naturally evolved out of this relationship that the board now has with this committee is we, we, when we wrote the charge, we knew we had certain documents that the committee was going to be able to utilize. We knew roughly the makeup and, and who we were hoping to solicit expert opinions from, but we, we weren't even exactly sure, you know, what to ask them, what, you know, can you recommend? And so we left the charge broad. And so one of the things that I appreciate about having left the charge broad at this point is it does kind of facilitate and, and necessitate frequent check-ins. And so here we are, the, you know, the committee has been meeting, the committee was formed in September, they've been meeting 
you know, for hours and hours and hours. And now here we are at our, at our first kind of action point with the committee. And so one of the questions that I got after the forum um, in, De in December was, well, I, I, don't, I still don't understand how the school board is going to vote on a consolidated school that's K-2. And I said, that's not, that's not what we're voting on. And so one of the kind of communication challenges that we're going to have is, is kind of communicating this piece by piece and making sure that people don't need to have all of the institutional knowledge but also understand where we are in the process and that it's okay to move the process along the track without necessarily having all of the answers. So for me, this idea that we would somehow renovate the buildings and build a fourth school while having our kids in the buildings, it, to me is, like I said two weeks ago, like I just don't see this as a viable option. And so for me, it makes natural sense now to move the peg forward and as a school board to kind of discuss, okay, well, so now what is the charge of the committee? You know, how do we, what, is, what makes sense as a motion to move the committee forward in their work. And so communicating that to the public and that, 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 that we're comfortable moving the peg along and that we don't necessarily, that we're not committing to a set building right now. Mm -hmm. And we're not committing to a location. And that's another sticking point for a lot of people. You know, we're, we're gonna have those individual discussions and those individual conversations as this project evolves. And so, it's, it's really important that people understand where we are right now and that it's okay to do it kind of piece by piece. And, and how do we communicate that? And I am thrilled to hear that the committee is kind of working on a communications subcommittee or, and obviously as chair of the communications committee, I would be happy to be engaged in that also. Um, just to make sure that we bring everybody, you know, along with us. Because this is this is going to be a long process. Mm -hmm. right. This and is just, just the first. I think just to like hop onto what you're saying, April. These questions are questions that do have to be answered. Yeah. Just not at this moment. I mean, we're we're not sending this to referendum. We're not voting to send it to referendum today, and they do have to be answered before that happens. Yes. But you're right. Like this is just this is one decision on the road. Um, and I, I also wanted to add that I think that it is super important that we have the reasons laid out as to why we came up with the recommendation that we did. And, and that includes giving you reasons why the other options probably aren't going to work as well, um, and including a fourth school, which was not really discussed a lot. Um, but I don't want to use those reasons to brush off people's concerns. Sure. Yep. So um, instead, I want, look, I would charge all of you to think about and the committee to think about taking those concerns and trying to weave them in to a plan that will take them into consideration. And, and by that, I mean not changing the recommendation for sure, but using those concerns and, and working with them so that our recommendation can hopefully, um, or, or our consolidated building can hopefully get to the point where it can address a lot of those concerns. And like I said, it's, it's important for us to have the reasons why, but I don't want to use those reasons as a, as a way of just brushing people aside because those concerns are legitimate. And to be honest, they're all concerns that we have talked about in the committee, that we share a lot of the concerns. We don't want kids getting lost in a building. Um, we, want, we don't want to lose community resources. So like these are all things that I think it's up to us to, to lead maybe the Long Range um, Planning Committee mm -hmm. to, um, to figure out a way that we can absorb those concerns. And, and yeah, well, I think that. that I think busing and traffic flow, the first two bullets, I think are like case in point to, to what you're saying is those are extremely valid concerns. I don't I would not be in favor of a consolidated school that meant our kids were going to be on the bus for 90 minutes. I mean, that's that's not appropriate. That's not an appropriate solution to an existing enrollment problem. But if we choose a location and we immediately engage in a transportation study, then that's how we kind of can make those more informed choices. But it, it, it does have to kind of go bit by bit at this point. 
Well, this, this conversation reminds me a lot of, of kind of where we started this whole process back meeting with the, formal, the former chair of the Wentworth uh, project. And, and the reason I'm thinking about it now is because what we're talking about, they already had from the very first day because they knew we need to build a new Location. school. And that decision was there. And all the emergent variables that came out along the path, they took on one by one. But one of the things the chair said to us every time we talked with him was he said, no matter what you come up to for an obstacle or a challenge or an opportunity or a threat, you have to be committed to what you're trying to do. We were trying to build a new Wentworth. And all the things that came up, they were challenges, but we overcame them because we stayed focused on that goal. Mm -hmm. And so today we're kind of trying to decide, like, what is our overall direction? But I think April makes a, a good point, and we all, actually all of you do, we all do, because busing, traffic flow, those things are going to come up. But if we know, and we, or we come to know, that a consolidated school or the three schools we have, if that's the direction that our students need, we will find a way to challenge and overcome those obstacles as well. Busing will be a challenge. We'll figure out what the solution is. Traffic flow and studies we're going to have to do no matter what we do. Whatever that study brings back to us, we will find a way to mitigate it in the best interest of our community. And so that doesn't change our charge at, at this point. We're kind of like almost pre-Wentworth at this point because we can't really even there's so many variables we can't answer, we're almost a little bit afraid to make a commitment about exactly what we want to build. And afraid might be, not be the right word, um, but I, I think, I don't know, I, I feel like we're so close, but we have to know that there will be more variables that will come in front of us, and we'll just have to work through them one by one. I think that's an excellent point. You know, at the office when we have large design issues, we often call it the guiding principles. And just like you said, when you know what your, you know, sort of the core value of this project, you know, right. When you know those answers, so the, the questions come, the answers to questions come easily when you know what your core, core principles are, those guiding principles for the project. So it may be that this communication we need to make is embodied with those. You know, maybe it's a statement, maybe it's these reworded into things that we as a steering committee feel are guiding principles that we'll hand off to a designer to say, you know, the solution doesn't work unless you can fit these five guiding principles into the solution. Uh, that's something we could definitely do as part of the committee. And that might help with un helping people understand why we've come to where we've come. And you know, by no means, too, is anyone brushing off the number three bullet of size of consolidated building. Yeah. yeah. It, it is, I mean, I hate to like keep saying it's a design issue, but it is a design issue. Um, schools are designed for you know, sizes of all you know, sorts, from you know, 25 people to 1,000 or more. And it's always a design issue as to how you actually make that school of whatever size you choose feel the way you want it to feel and you know, behave the way you want it to. And that's, that's why we would rely on the experts for that. You know, um, one of the other committee members who is not here is very adamant about the fourth point up there, uh, cost. Um, and so I wish you were here because he would do a much better job with this. And I'll try and channel my inner cost person. Um, I don't like to name names. Um, one of the points he made, he's not terribly excited about the prospect of spending lots of money, but one of the points he does make is that we're avoiding costs by taking this on now. You know, the longer we put this off, we'll be maintaining the existing structures for longer, which means that sort of costs sunk into a space that's no longer our solution. So the faster we can get to a solution we all want, um, that dollar is better spent, and we don't lose dollars along the way to get there. Um, and we went into long conversations about physical plant, you know, boilers and windows and roofs and leaks and plumbing issues and all sorts of stuff in an aged facility. Um, so I think bonding and costs are always a concern. Uh, it's always, you know, everyone wants to hear about why something is on or under or over budget. Um, I, dacked, I thought someone came up to me after the meeting last week and, or two weeks ago. Um, made the point, uh, we never mentioned that Wentworth came in under budget. So I, there it is, 2.8 million under. So I think one of the things that's good to remember is budgets are budgets and we all have budgets in our lives. We try and meet them. Um, there are ways to come in under, um, but it's still going to be money we need to spend. Um, when we'll, I think as a town, we need to understand that we're getting value for that dollar. Um, and if the rules about bonding were different, maybe we could have a different conversation about saving money over time, but they are what they are. So we're gonna to have to borrow money and do something. 
Uh, we should do something that brings the best value to our town. That's, I think the committee's position is that this is, the consolidated solution was the best value. And of course, some the little voice in the back of my head saying, it's not just dollars, it's students. Um, someone else should talk other than me. <laughs> interesting that you say that because um, I, I when we would have discussions I would come back to dollars because for me students was a, a given mm -hmm. and um, I thought that in the discussions with community members the dollars was the dollars discussion was going to be the more difficult discussion to have and then it was interesting to hear people that were cons had other opinions about about schools right. and facilities and I think you had always fallen on that concern about schools and facilities but for me the the schools and facilities piece seemed so uh, as such an obvious need I, I so um, I guess one of the concerns I have is is and, and I was happy to hear Hillary's suggestion was how to take some of those people who understand the need for, to do something about the schools and incorporate that in and how, how we go forward because I, I guess I wasn't anticipating such a fractured viewpoint from people who understand that we've got to do something. Right. Well, I think it's the part of the process we're at too. I mean, we're, we were asking people what they thought about mm -hmm. these different options and so we got that. But I guarantee you there's going to be people talking about costs later on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, we, we vote on dollars. Right. 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 So that's why right. he comes to the front. Right. But I think the purpose that we're here is student, student right. success. Right. Um, so I'm going to just go to another bullet. Um, busing and traffic flow are, are pretty much one thing. Um, and I think you've already hit on the point that we need to know where before we can figure out all these solutions. But I think um, we've also talked in the committee how we have a lot of schools with buses going to a lot of places. And so there's some raw data I think we could glean from the town's data already to help us solve some basic questions about when we find a chunk of land somewhere that's big enough, is that a reasonable spot to even consider? And I think what you said too is really important that these are um, these all need to be addressed, but they, by virtue of where we are in the process, they can't really be addressed right, right now. I mean, right. like it was very interesting to me because people um, at the forum were like, I don't want my kid's bus ride to be longer, when I was under the assumption that everybody's bus ride would be significantly shorter. So it's just interesting, like, you know, what those assumptions are and mm -hmm. how they're different for different people. But like you said, you know, when we narrow down, even if we narrow down options, even if we don't have one option, even when we narrow down options for a location, if this, if this ends up moving forward, that's when we can then go to our resources. Um, our, we have a transportation director who literally knows the routes like the back of her hand um, and could probably just off the top of her head tell you like who can get picked up where. And, um, but that's when we would need to analyze that. And, and like April said, if, if we come to the conclusion that this is going to mean hour and a half bus rides for every kid in Scarborough, then it's not a solution anymore. And right. like, we would need to do something to, to change that. But it's important to note that these are all things that we're thinking about and they're concerns that we share, but we haven't gotten there yet. Like you said with the Wentworth, like everybody knew like the goal was to build a new Wentworth and so they were already like four steps ahead in the process. We're, we're not there in the process, that's the decision that we're making today. Right. Then we can start you know, jumping on a lot of these other decisions right. and getting data and information. I might be jumping ahead with this one, but at what point I don't know if you've talked about it as a committee. At what point are we making the decision about what grades are going to go in a school? Should that be the choice that we make? It feels like that's going to have an impact on a lot. Yeah. You know? So I think it's not quite yet. If My opinion is that yeah. it's not quite yet because like the committee has made a recommendation to move forward with a consolidated school and to also, for us, to look at right. um, how we could, I keep using the word mitigate, but mitigate some of the other space concerns 
in Scarborough. So I think that that's a decision that we have to make. And um, and then I feel like it would be really important for us to get feedback from um, you know those administrators and teachers who are in those grades and try to figure out if that would work and, and how that would work um, and get that information back to the committee. And, or, and didn't you? Didn't you have a suggestion that we would solicit input from the architect, if I remember correctly, in, in, make, in making a recommendation for that? We certainly can. I mean, I think there is our long-range planning committee. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I'm sure there are some, some decisions that have, conversations that have gone on there that could probably save us a lot of time in our conversations. Right. Um, and yes, once the RFQ is put out and a designer is on board, those are the things that we can feed to them and say, Long Reach Plains looked at it, and right. uh, if we do this, this, and this, the school should house these grades, and we'll solve right. the problem here. So I have this, and I have, I have a witness. I have this fantastic handwritten note here that says, reach out to Andrew. What can uh, Long Range Facilities Planning do to help? Because I, I think we need to coordinate those two groups. And, and the other part that actually I'll talk about in a little bit when I get my legislative update is that one of those emerging variables I was talking about, well, I'm going to talk about one tonight because pre-K is maybe more immediate than we thought, or at least some version of it. And I'll talk about that in my legislative update. But certainly we have to think about, and I've done the numbers and crunching, and if you look at the rough layout, basically every entering uh, class in Scarborough is between 200 and 250 students, or plus or minus. And so you think about if this is a K through two school, it looks at one size. If it's K through three, it gets larger. If it was pre-K through three, it's over 1,000 students without batting an eyelash. And that's just rough numbers. Now, that's a very different situation. And so if we think about, if we're looking at a consolidated building as our, as our choice, then what we decide to do with our phases has to align with those core principles right. of planning and how big we want that school to be and how can we design a school, how big can a school be and design it so it's not overwhelming. I mean, those are the conversations that we have to start to have. But I think pre-K is one example of something that I think is going to impact that. You know, conversations that have happened in long-range planning, one of them is do we keep one of our current buildings and renovate just one and have as a pre-K center? I'm just throwing that out. So these are all conversations that are happening, but I think kind of this first decision helps direct those conversations because otherwise you just spin out kind of into oblivion. You're in what we call in the research world analysis paralysis where there are so many variables and so many studies and so many charts that you could look at, you wind up getting a headache before you make any headway. So you have to start with a decision to direct the conversation a little bit. Yes. Yes. <laughs> How's that? I agree. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you. This was really helpful um, to have that debrief moment to pull together all of our thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, moving on to... We do have the students report. I'm going to see if we can get this to connect back over. Now it's frozen. It's frozen on our laptop. Yeah, it too, froze on ours. But we reloaded. We got that. Yeah, okay. Uh, oh, there you go. So on December 13th, it was National Hot Cocoa Day. So the unified PLT group at the middle school created the theme, Warm Your Heart, and they handed out hot cocoa to students and staff as they entered the building that morning. The unified PLT group is a group of staff working together to create inclusive opportunities in the school and community where every student can feel like they're an integral part of Scarborough Middle School. And as you can see from the pictures, the hot cocoa definitely brought some smiles to the staff and students on a nice chilly winter morning. Um, Wayne Beach from MM Productions visited the high school's video production two class on December 16th. Um, he's an experienced screenwriter and he gave students insight into screenwriting and working in the industry. Um, and then I know Leanne already mentioned this, but I just 
it's mind blowing. I'm so proud of my classmates, um, Jarrett Flaker and Bella Dickinson for both being named the Scarborough High School Athletes of the Decade by the Portland Press Herald. I can't say enough amazing things about these two athletes. And then student leaders from the high school participated in a discussion-based day of learning called Boys to Men. They talked about consent and safe communication in a room that looks pretty familiar. <laughs> And then juniors and seniors in the adulting in the 21st century class at the high school got some hands-on experiences with working with dry wall, drywall. Um, employees from Oak Hill Ace Hardware came to the high school to help these students with this activity. Actually, to touch on what Kristen said about the uh, boys to men training, I was there and I facilitated the training and it was a really good experience for everyone that was there. Everyone learned a lot, they said it was really fun. And I think the students took away a lot from it. So that's definitely something that should continue. All right, so here on the left, we have on December 20th, the last day before break, there was a school-wide assembly at Wentworth, which was organized by the Allied Arts team. Students shared greetings in various language. The um, student marimba club performed, and there were some very special guests who were the main marimba band. And then on the right, the members of the ukulele club provided some seasonal entertainment as students arrived at Wentworth School the day before, so the 19th. And then, let's see. These are some photos from the Hour of Code at, prim at the primary schools. In the top left is a photo of students doing a design challenge to build a foundation. In the middle is students creating an Ozo bot. Not quite sure what that is, but that's what it said on Twitter. And top right <laughs> is an assembly at Blue Point School. Communications has not met since our last meeting. Um, we took on the communication of the public hearing. Um, that was our big focus for the month of December. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of what we were able to do with the resources we have available, um, you know, we, we met our own expectations and our own calendar. Um, and, you know, as always, we're open to feedback on how we can get information out um, better or more effectively. Our next Spotlight, Spotlight Award <coughs> winner will be announced and celebrated on January 16th. And our next Communications Committee meeting is Monday, January 6th at 9.30. So there's not a whole lot new on this slide, but uh, I did just want to reiterate that the uh, committee, um, I actually put a doodle poll out this week, actually I think today, to try and get some availability about our next meeting. And we're really invested in um, a facilities upkeep plan. We already have a plan in, a, in certain formats, namely a, a more uh, financially based matrix. But we're looking to develop a document, and I've talked about this before, that the community at, ho at the whole could digest and understand just what goes in to keeping our district running, what our plan is for swapping out heating units and skylights and windows and all those kind of things. Um, as of very recently, the chair is looking forward to reaching out the chair of the building steering committee to coordinate <laughs> those two groups and uh, groups and see how we can uh, uh, help each other and uh, more to come in 2020 I'm looking forward to um, really developing out both of these initiatives that um, we mentioned and I think the committee is excited about it too uh, so we have our next meeting is on January 21st, so at that meeting we're going to get a debrief from Kate as to uh, what has occurred so far in the budget process. As you can see from my first bullet, it has started already, which seems crazy, I feel like it just ended. Um, but they had the teachers listening sessions over um, throughout December, and so we'll be able to hear the themes from that session and what will be worked into the new budget. Um, and hot off the press from Paul this afternoon that we're, we're trying to schedule the workshop with town council to get um, to have a discussion around the use of impact fees for the eight corners overage in February. So they tentatively scheduled for the 19th, potentially February 5th. Uh, can I just add a request that if you were the school board member that attended any of those teacher workshops, if you could just get your notes to us um, in advance of that January 21st meeting, yeah. just so we can kind of compile that. That would be great. <laughs> Tillery Durkin. <laughs> uh, liaison, community center. 
I don't know, Sarah, if you want to give an update, do you want me to? Yeah, I haven't been to uh, the last um, meeting, so. I said we haven't had a lot of meetings um, <coughs> recently. We did have the um, presentation from the builders r with respect to what the lease option would be um, well, beginning of December, and that was a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest news is we will be working with um, an outreach firm, and I, for whatever reason, it just went right out of my head. Dun and bread. <laughs> no. Uh, there's an outreach group that's going to be doing oh. some marketing camp, not marketing campaigns, but an understanding of very where done, we are. Th very done. Thank yeah. you. Um, we'll be doing some more in-depth analysis of where the community is as a pulse on the center. Yeah, it's essentially a feasibility study. So they're they're taking a lot of the information that we already have and it's basically doing like a market research. And the goal of that, I, I believe, and Paul, you can nod yes or no if you recall, but from <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> but I don't. I think the timing of that is not necessarily for that their um, report to be delivered prior to when the committee reports out to town council. So it's basically for the town to use for however long it takes. I guess I don't know what the timelines are on it. I thought wasn't the committee supposed to report out to the town council already? It, yes. January. Um, it was delayed. Actually, nope. Mr. Johnson, would you? Nope. <laughs> we'll call on. We'll take a card out of your playbook and call on people from the audience. I didn't know I was allowed back up here. So thank you. Um, yeah. So all day Monday, virtually. I think they're here for upwards of ten Friday. hours. So they're going it's to meet tomorrow Friday. from tomorrow. one to five. Tomorrow. Noon to five. Yes. You know what? On second thought. Yeah, right. <laughs> They're going to be interviewing all those different subcommittees for the community center project, as well as the committee as a whole. Uh, and then the point of them coming in, the most in, from the council side, side, the most important point is for them to look over essentially our revenue projections to see if those are accurate. So a lot of this is going to be based off, is the revenue there to support the lease? So we wanted a third party to come in and say, okay, finance subcommittee you've done a great job but we actually think that it's a little closer to this number or that number uh, now because of that they they do have to look over the survey that we've we've conducted neighboring towns to see if the demand is there for what what our sub finance subcommittee is actually using as numbers for possible memberships and possible daily fees or what have you uh, but that report actually won't be completed I think as uh, Ms. Layton said, uh, that, <laughs> that report won't be completed by January 19th. So the community center subcommittee is going to report to the town council. We're going to then workshop that and talk about it and all that fun stuff. And then the, and then the consultant report will probably come about a month later. Uh, but we did order it so if, we, if the train does get down the tracks and we're in decision making mode that somebody can come in and affirm what we're thinking or can make adjustments to it. Can, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, are the committee and the town council aware that the school is independently um, in negotiations or conversations, I guess I should say, with um, the edge yeah. in, in, in terms of getting preferential yeah, absolutely. meal time, I, ice time, independently of a community center? Yeah, right? sure. And I think it's worth repeating as many times as humanly possible. This, the ice time, so to speak, uh, this is a, that the edge facility will be there and that ice will be readily available to the Scarborough school system and the public of Scarborough, regardless of how this community center helps out. I mean, how it pans out, but Thank yes, you. absolutely. The, your discussions with the edge sports complex to help your teams with ice time primarily, I believe is the big one is independent of what we're doing for the community center. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your help. Um, town Council? Town Council. Um, no real update right now <laughs> other than to say that Councillor Glaistein and I um, have arranged to meet and have coffee next week. And so if there's anything that is pressing that you would like me to bring up with her, shoot me an email and I will make sure that it gets discussed. Call me in the Looking um, forward to it. Legislative? Uh, yeah. So um, 
I alluded to this a little while ago, but I spoke with Councillor, um, Councillor, Representative Baybine on December 20th. Um, the topic was LD1715, which I'm reading off the page because these things always read so beautifully. An act to organize the provision of services for children with disabilities from ages birth to five years. So in a nutshell, what that means is that the state is looking to decentralize what's currently done at Child Development Services in Augusta and bring that down to the district level. Um, a few reasons that this is of paramount importance to this group, um, these are just three that I thought of earlier when I was kind of going through my notes, is funding, timing, and then full out pre-K. What does this mean? Um, because if we're gonna, if district's gonna be asked to put in services for a certain sector of that population, that feels like it might be a baby step toward an all out statute mandate for that entire group. Um, so I, I talked with the representative about that. Um, he wanted me to share that the legislature will, legislature will likely be pursuing an RFP to evaluate the potential district to district impact of decentralizing away from CDS. Um, right now it's pretty wide known news. In fact, I think it's been in the media several times that uh, CDS as it's operating right now is not operating in a, in a fiscally healthy way. Uh, and so certainly looking at decentralizing this to the district level is, is something they want to evaluate. Is it going to be better? Is it going to be worse? What does it mean um, for the districts around the state? Because obviously different districts have different amounts of, um, of support, of uh, community support and then state support. Um, so pre-K overall with this on the table is looking a little more likely. That's kind of unofficial at this point, but that's the way these things kind of tend to start off. Um, one co topic we had, because of course the, one of the questions I said is well, who's talking about funding, what, what do we think funding's going to look like? Um, there is no answer to that right now except that it's looking like funding would be a separate equation from the funding we have for our general educational fund. So it would be a separate equation that's not, doesn't impact the overall funding at districts, which makes sense because if you think about it, that could be really uh, interesting to see how that played out and factored in. Um, so a couple of recommendations that I kind of walked away from, um, either indirectly or directly as a result of my conversation with him, uh, was that the BOA should consider act, uh, asking our staff for a cost analysis, an estimate of what a pre-K program would cost, and then once we know that, we should think about how to work that into our budget. Apparently this was the approach that was taken when the discussions about all-day kindergarten started, and then when it did come down, we were prepared and we knew we had an idea of what it would cost. We already started working on our budget, so it wasn't like this stop and scramble and try and figure all that out. Um, so that's something I wanted to bring forward to this group. And then the other thing that I thought was interesting, it actually relates directly to what we were talking about earlier, is looking to see if there's any community data, either with the school district or with the community in general, as to exactly what size of a population we'd be talking about. Um, first, immediately with special services um, service to uh, students ages birth to five. Um, but then also overall pre-K, what do the numbers look like? What, what portion are currently served by the private sector or, or outside of the community public sector? Because I think we've, in the discussions we've talked about this a little bit in long range planning, um, but the overall consensus is that most likely it wouldn't be, at least not immediately, every student leaving their private pre-K to come to Scarborough public pre-K. It would probably be a, a gradual thing and probably would never be 100%. I imagine there are probably some parents that would want to stay with their, their private options that, that have the ability to do so. Um, so any data we have about that sector of our population I think is important in this discussion. Um, so that was a recommendation that came forward. Um, and as a, obviously the last thing I have here is as a planner, uh, I uh, really appreciated uh, the representative's suggestion of kind of this anticipatory approach of trying to get out in front of this and figure out what's it going to cost so that when it does come around and, and float down to us on a beautifully worded document, from the state, we will be ready to, to act and, and to get that service in place for our students. Can I just? Please. Uh, um, so I, for, I just want to clarify one thing, and then I have a little bit of information about the pre-K stuff. So um, when Nick's talking about CDS services birth to, birth to five, mm -hmm. that, that's not the, that's not, and then we talk about a pre-K population, those things overlap, but they're not the, the same. Like, right. right, like so pre-K is really, is just the year before kindergarten. Yeah. So it's not necessarily even like two years of preschool like you might send your kid to and then there's still gonna be like zero, one, two, and three that, that if CDS services are transferred to the district, we are still responsible for whether we have a public pre-K or not. Um, and, and they are like slightly, I mean we could still offer CDS services through private, I mean that's how they do it now, through private right. 
um, through private preschools and through other other things. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear. And then the second thing is um, we did have a pre-K committee that uh, hasn't met for a year. It had a ton of people on it. Diane, were you on it? I don't know. It had a ton of people on it, um, like some kindergarten teachers, some um, administrators, some, who was on that? Were you on that? No, okay, well anyway. <laughs> I don't remember who was on it, but my point is I have a giant notebook, like one of the two yeah. inchers of information yeah. regarding public pre-K, um, and we did at the time do a lot of research into like how much did it cost Kennebunk when they put in private, so we have some of that that I can, yeah. I don't can know I if I have it digitally, but I can actually, share it, and I'll give it to Kristen. Kristen. That would be great. I'll give it to Kristen. Yeah. And, and Joanne has it, so you might yeah, have, I have it. Copies okay. Of it in my office. Joanne had it. You might have it. I do. I've already had it. <laughs> Actually, I, that was um, my thoughts at, at first when you were talking about that was, oh, great, we should talk about that in, in the finance committee mm -hmm. and sort of get on that. But then I, I guess I thought about the missing link of public input about what the public wants until it's mandated. And so it seems like it's the responsible thing to do, I guess, mm -hmm. in, in terms of preparing. But on the other hand, I, I, until it's mandated, is that sort of bypassing the, the public input of what, what we'd yeah. like to see happen? And so um, I'm curious but, what your thoughts are. But I think the public that. would want to have the information about how much it costs. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. as a part of the decision-making mm -hmm. process. Like, well, I mean, because everybody has to choose, right? Here's my value, and, and where do I, you know, what, what dollar amount mm -hmm. do I value but, that at? But what did you say about putting it into the budget? Oh, well, to, to think about, so apparently kind of, and this is all feedback I got through this conversation, was that when full year-round year uh, kindergarten came about, they kind of got out in front of it, figured out what the cost would be, and then kind of built it into the budget as a placeholder. I think that they had more immediate knowledge about it coming around the okay. bend a lot sooner than this might. Um, but I like the suggestion of getting out in front of what is it actually going to cost, how would it look in the budget, where would the different pieces live, so that you're ready to plug it in if you need it. I, I, I agree with that. I, yeah. I would be hesitant about, about going forward more, sure. I think, without having more of right. a, a public input. Yeah. Nick, can I ask you another question? I'm oh, sorry. No, go, ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. In your conversations, was it ever made clear that there's a point in the process where our feedback would be shared with our legislators as to help them make their decision? Right. Um, so, no, it's a very good question. So, um, at the tail end of our conversation, we kind of had a, a more broad discussion about the relationship between this body and our elected representatives at the state level, as well as and, and town council, but obviously I didn't get into that discussion too much. Um, but certainly, um, I actually have copies of his business card for all of you, and he wants to make sure that he opens up that, that conversation. But also, he shared with me that Councillor Chiazzo also wants to be conversing with this group and getting feedback from this group um, when things come down the pike. So I, I feel like starting, I feel like this conversation was the start of something broader there, um, but certainly I'm open to discussions as a liaison from this group as to how do we keep that and make it bi-directional yes. so that they feel they can reach out to us as much as we can reach out to them. So I think that's the start of a, of a relationship. Thanks. Uh, I just want to piggyback a bit on Alicia's comment on public input. Are the community forums that have been happening, the roundtables, are those going to be continuing this year? No. Because um, if so, that would be a great opportunity for uh, mm -hmm. the council to have engagement with this because it's going to definitely impact um, facility size as well as right. our finances. I will reach out to the chair of communications for the town council um, and see if I can get a joint communications committee meeting um, on the calendar. Just want to um, make sure that we leave this with an action on coming up with some numbers. So I don't know. The, we can take that as an action as a finance committee, but we we can't answer the question. So we'll obviously need input. So do you? Is that information that you have or you have access to get that you could bring to a finance committee meeting? What information about starting to put together costs for? There, no, I don't. Is that in the? No, I mean there is no pre-K committee task force as of now. As of, so the board would have to decide to reconvene that if we thought that it was 
it's just me. Yeah, right now it's it's Chris <laughs> just. <laughs> Chris. <laughs> but the, she's the liaison to nothing. Like, but there's, <laughs> no, there's no committee to liaise with. But it's one that I believe that we would need to redirect the superintendent uh, to open. But that's it's a my point. Wide. Yeah, um, and I think that's easy enough to say. Right. Yes, so this is going to need to be. So I guess my point is, we need to decide whether it's the time to reconstruct that yeah. committee I or don't not. Think because it's a decision that can't not be made at this point, because it's that's too many negatives. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, it's a, it's got to happen. We have yeah, to make that right. decision. Okay. Yeah. Boys. Anyway, we don't have a lot of financial data. We have a lot of comparison data about what it costs in other districts. Okay. We don't. There was some. Oh, you probably haven't looked at it, but there was some data about like. Um, estimates on on how many kids we would have um, and there's some finagling because you want to have classrooms that are that, this is a whole different discussion but like there was some data on on a very rough estimate on how many kids but there's no way that you could have data that's substantial enough for the finance committee with what we have okay. now okay. but is this I a, don't think. is this a CDS Estimate or no, a it is estimate. not a CDS that, estimate. That, it is that only pre K. For, Do is we it, have those numbers? Is that yes. somewhere of how many kids enter kindergarten through with CDS? Yes, yes. yes. That's, yes. Good. yes. Right. Mm -hmm. That's good. Is he looking for a CDS estimate? He's not looking for anything. He's not looking for anything. Yeah. Oh. He, we, that we, were, right. Right. we were talking about it from a finance perspective. Right. What we would need. What information we would need to even start to compile costs, and, and so obviously say, like, enrollment just, numbers would be paramount to this that. This is an assumption on my part, so we might want to um, get further information. But the cost of pre-K, if it's if it's mandated, we might get some money from the yes. state, but a lot of it is on the district to pay for. The cost of providing CDS services to to those children is not necessarily on the district. That's state funded. It well, currently and, is state funded. Well, and and to be clear, there are two different funding things we're talking about here. So right. so decentralizing CDS services to the districts, there would be state funding for that. It is not determined if that funding would remain at a hundred percent. There's no criteria. Now, when we talk about pre-K in general. I think that's a different discussion, and yes. I think the reason that we kind of headed in that direction is because uh, even though it's kind of an adjacent service, it feels like it could be a step. It, if feasibly it said, wow, then you know, decentralizing this to all the districts, once they've started to build out facilities, those that don't have them or, or put the services in place, what's the next step? And so I, I think getting out in front of that and thinking about it now is the time to kind of say, okay, because I think community input is really important as, when we're in a place where pre-K education is an option. But I think we're actually working toward a point where it's, it may not be an option. Now, that's not a, that's not a definite, yeah. but I think planning for that potential eventuality would make a lot of sense. I, so I, totally, it is I totally agree with yeah. you. I just wanted to be really clear that these it's are two separate, separate yes. things. They, they can overlap at some point, but they don't right now. They don't right now. I, I just... I agree in premise, but to me it seems so speculative because birth to five for CDS, just I'm not necessarily convinced that that's something that's going to statutorily fall to schools as a service to provide. I mean, that just seems so far out of but the But that's spectrum. the actual bill that's... I that's understand that, but, oh, okay. but I, I can't envision a world in which school, schools are, are providing services to infants in... But it, 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 who are in the CDS services? But they're just—they're not infants aren't coming to the schools to get the services. The schools are just subcon. Even if they're subcontracting it out, that seems so so sp yeah. speculative to me. How do we even? How do we even anticipate those costs? It just. But like even now, like some if you have a one-year-old who's getting services from CDS, they're getting them in their own home or at a speech therapist. That wouldn't change. It would just be that the school district would be responsible for coordinating it and paying for it. I understand that. But, yeah. so, oh, okay. but what I'm saying is, okay, it could be, ultimately it could be birth to five that the school is responsible for. It could be four to five. It could be, you know, you know there's so many possibilities to, that it just seems maybe like a lot of manpower to ask the school to say, can you envision all of these different scenarios for something that, that we're, we're so, 
is just so far in front of us. And so I'm a little bit worried about that. Well, and that's why I think the representative started by saying the very next step is to do an RFP for a feasibility study of what this would look like through different renditions. Actually, interestingly, somewhat parallel to the discussion we had earlier, kind of looking at what are the options, what are the, what's the feasibility of it, because I think you're right. This could take a lot of different flavors depending on how it's approached. Um, I, I think I imagine the wording birth to five is because across the state there are probably different age ranges and it's just that's a very safe set of brackets. Not for CDS. CDS is birth to five years. Birth old. to five, right? And then and then yeah, it but falls that's to different the schools. than pre-K because the pre-K range is right. narrow. So the pre-K is four year olds. Right. So the pre-K is four and five year olds. Right. But it's not. It's currently unrelated to CDS. You, right. you can have a, it's like a, the circle, it's like the square and the rectangle thing, right? Like you can have a four year old who's in pre K who also receives CDS services, mm -hmm. but not they're not all. necessarily related. Right. So I guess, there, like I said, there's like overlap, but, but right now, this bill that you're talking about right. is CDS and that's right. zero to five. So what happens is when you turn five years old, this happened, this, I know this because this happened to my kid. When you turn five years old, you are handed off from CDS right. to the schools, whether you go to school or not. Like my child wasn't in school at five years old because she, and she was still in preschool, mm -hmm. but because she turned five years old, she was now the responsibility of the school district, even though she went to a private preschool and hadn't entered kindergarten yet. So I think what they're trying to do now is they're trying to take that handoff away, hand off yes. away and, and it's just the school's responsibility. I'm not... I mean, I assume that it would work very similar to the way it works now, except that instead of CDS coordinating everything, the school district would coordinate everything. I wouldn't be opposed to asking for like the four to five range for CDS services to try to get a financial estimate. I think that because I can That's see it. that, I can envision that as being a logical first step transition if they were going to pass legislation. But I think otherwise that that would be so out overwhelming for school districts to even contemplate that and I worry about the man hours that uh, for People our ask spend. to say for, for yeah for us to respond to that say give us an estimate of all these different variations so that may or may not ever come that, to yeah, that, yeah. yeah. I, I think the way the bill is written now we should think about basically this this service and the support for this service moving to the district as a responsibility. Now, as far as what that translates to in other types of education for students of that age, I don't know. But I don't think that the CDS, I think that what is currently done by CDS, if it moves to the district responsibility, the whole thing is going to move. That's yes. the way it sounds in the, in, that's the way yes. it reads. And that's the they're conversation They're not, they're not gonna move only four year olds and, right. and, and then that's keep right. CDS at zero, to, I mean, right. not currently anyway. Right. It's not on the table currently. Right. You don't see that as being an option for them if they do this RFP and they're like, wow, that is like I mean, maybe. an insurmountable thing. Let's start but with four. They would have to, re I mean, they'd retitle re their bill. bill. And re yeah. I mean, that all could happen. I mean, yeah. this is all very early. Um, I guess what I walked away with the conversation with feeling is that since districts are, are potentially going to be asked to provide any service or be responsible for any service for students less than five years old, that's getting into an age bracket that is that connects with the same bracket of people that are in overall pre-k program and so this might be a time to start thinking about that because currently districts are not asked to support students under five years old and once you tiptoe into that realm does that open up the door for other adjacent services i, I think that's the the point that that we that, I, that this is what i walked away with but they are two separate things and i think the other thing is that the information about how much it costs for Scarborough kids at CDS mm -hmm. is out there. That's, we're not asking any, I mean, we can collect that data. It's, it's, it's CDS has that data. Right. So, so that's not a guess. With an existing structure. Right, right. So, I mean, that's, uh, I why don't we, I, I think we should just agree that the finance committee can sort of talk to Kate about that and see what's feasible in terms right. from her perspective and, uh, I guess I wouldn't even know what to talk to her about, though. Like, we don't have, we, we can get, so I think we do need an action out of this conversation. It, it seems like maybe we need to formally reinstate the. I'm adding that as an agenda item for our next meeting. Okay. Because then Kate would need to get that information mm -hmm. yeah. from somebody. Cool. 
cool. Okay, but I just want to say again, that's a totally separate cost <laughs> and information than the CDS conversation mm -hmm. that's actually on the table, like the bill that's actually on the table. Understood. I understand. But we can there make is two things the on the table, bill, right? Well, it's the no. pre-K and the CDS. No. no. Only CDS pre -K is, is not really on the, the legislative right agenda right now. But wasn't the recommendation to start... What one of the suge the suggestion was to think about starting that conversation ahead of right. the next step uh, for district support of students of that age bracket. That is that is a little bit speculatory, but as a planner, it would be wise to start more formally thinking about it. Is it? Big, was there any time frame? No. Well, the I will say that the the uh, RFP process will likely be part of the next session. Okay. That's the next step. But again, that's for CVS, not for me. That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. It's first place. Sorry, am I? That's all right. <laughs> I just feel like it's so, it's very, it's, people have it tied together in their heads. And, and right now, CDS is the only thing that's on the legislative table. Pre-K may or may not be sometime soon. I'm not saying that we shouldn't mm -hmm. find out information about how much it costs. I think it's a super valuable service for a district to provide and that it, we would be better off knowing how much that costs if it ever did come to it. But, but the only thing that's on the table right now is the CDS moving to the districts and, and that's what's having the RFP and. Mm -hmm. and yes. Nick's like, yeah, I said that 75 times. <laughs> <laughs> There's no doubt. Oh, we good. <laughs> um, lastly, is there a motion to adjourn tonight? Yes. So yes. moved. Second. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my God. Was your dad? Yeah.